Let me grab a uh, water real quick. Yeah, you're okay. good. I'm post this on the old on the old Patreon stream. You just like your ass being just there on the TV. Do we have any viewers? Will it tell us if we have any viewers? What? Uh, yeah, it'll tell us. Okay. It'll have a little one there on the top. Hmm. Or two. Or three. If we're lucky. <laughs> if we're lucky. All right. Oh, dude, you're going to go away. Here we go. You ready? Yeah. Okay. In three, two, one. And welcome to episode 352 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with Andrew Swafford and no and one else. Ba, ba, ba. Oh, Gigi's sitting right here. <laughs> Gigi, do you want to like have some And feedback? Gigi Kitten. Gigi Kitten. I have some wanna... kittens over here too uh, for viewers. Hold on. There's, oh, there's Cooper. not one, but two. Kittens. And introducing for the first time on the podcast, Gigi Kitten and Cooper Kitten and Ollie Kitten. <laughs> they're all posing. Yeah, they're all, they're, they all have their thoughts on the movie process. Um, mm. On today's episode, we got movies that we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we will be doing our first of two Patreon picks. Um, this Ooh. one comes from the kittiest of kittens who's not oh. a patron anymore. Good episode to have kittens. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and but they're not a patron anymore. So like what? I, I'm really excited because we can just like lay into this movie if we want to. Did it's the like kittiest of kittens cancel their subscription as soon as they found out we were doing their movie? Like, okay, I got no, my money worth. I'm done. It's been a while. Yeah. Oh, by the way, this episode of Cemetery brought to you by PBR. PBR the working man's beer. <laughs> Are you, um, when you're looking at the screen, by the way, do you see yourself to the left and yes, to the right? It's, it's, Let's it's, do like a little clink. You know, clink. Okay. Clink. 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 <laughs> this is not good audio. No. Um, this is anyway. all the more reason to subscribe to our Patreon, everyone. That's true. Uh, no, we're, for the kiddies of Kittens, we're going to watch 2019's The Prodigy. Which is a movie I had no, um, <laughs> like, no recollection or no uh, knowledge of prior to them sending it to us. So. Have you uh, have you looked up this movie's box office mojo stats? Did this actually play in multiplexes? It could. We'll we'll, we'll have that by part two. Okay, that? I'll go ahead and start some preliminary research. There you go. You know. Um, Head over to cinematary.com though. We got some good stuff. We're going to have some new writing up. And then we're also going to have, um, we'll have the, uh, the young critics. Um, that's going to mm -hmm. be coming out, uh, beginning of next week. So, uh, if, you know, head over to cinematary.com if you'd like to vote on that, which is always a fun time. So, or just go to the website, check it out, you know, just, uh, just go peruse. But let's go ahead and talk about movies that we saw this week. I'm going to kick us off, um, I saw this a couple weeks ago, but I didn't get a chance to talk about it. And that is uh, 2004's Collateral. Great uh, movie. Great movie. Love it. By, by Michael Mann. Um, I got on a... I can't remember if I watched it. Did I watch this before or after I watched Tenet? Watched it before. I think I watched... I can't... I've been wanting to watch this for a while. Because I, I, I do like Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise is very mm -hmm. fun in movies. Um, and I kind of wanted to see... I, I know that people have like pointed at this as like good good tom cruise movie that's like outside that you're used yeah. to kind of seeing him in. one of the best um for those who don't know uh it follows a cab driver named max who's played by jamie fox who uh picks up this man played by tom cruise who offers him uh about like six hundred dollars to just drive him around for the night um but then it becomes quickly clear that tom cruise is an assassin and so uh, for the rest of the night, it's kind of Jamie Foxx versus Tom Cruise. He kind of tries to come to terms with like his role in all this and then uh, realizes that he, um, you know, it becomes a little bit personal. I'll just say that it becomes personal at the end. And also Mark Ruffalo's in this movie. <laughs> 
I just want to, I'm not even going to address, like, dig into, like, what Mark Ruffalo, like, it's just Mark Ruffalo's in this movie. I it's don't weird. even remember that. Mark so. Ruffalo is, like, the, but he has such a, un, like, a, so he's the under, like, the undercover cop who finds the first guy that Tom Cruise murders. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tom Cruise's character. <laughs> what is it? What's his character? Vincent. That Vincent murders. Vincent, yeah. Um. But yeah, and so Mark Ruffalo shows up and he looks like a white person dressed up as a Latino person. Um, is that and, a thing? Like, is that what they're trying to do? Yeah, he's like, he's like, oh, an undercover, he's an undercover cop who's like hanging out with this guy. And so then, but then he like never goes, hey, I'm going to stop and change. But, he's but just is, like, that his, is that his undercover persona or is Mark Ruffalo actually playing Latino in this movie? He might. I don't know. It's a. It's just. I was more like, well, why is Mark Ruffalo here? <laughs> it was kind of like you invited him to a party, and you're just like. Also, oh. uh, Jada Pinkett Smith is in. Yeah, there. Like, I've really been watching a her. lot. I've been watching a lot of Jada Pinkett Smith movies. Like, like I watched Bamboozled. I watched something else with mm. her where I was just like, Jada. Jada's good. She's good. <laughs> She's good in Girls Trip. She's good in Magic Mike XXL. What was the other? What's the other? Jade? I'm just gonna like look as we uh, as we record. I've been watching Jada Pinkett Smith movies lately, and uh, Jada's a great actress. I don't think mm-hmm. I don't think people talk about her anyway. Um, so this is this one's interesting because it's it's kind of the way I described it um, when I was talking to Michael a couple weeks ago because we were gonna talk about it. Um, I think last week, but I was talking to him about it. And was like it's pretty much they take Michael Mann is like all right, let's have Tom Cruise play his character from mission impossible. But this is what it would be like if he was that person, but in real life, because mm. if he was actually that person, he'd be a sociopath and <laughs> a terrible person. Like he wouldn't be yeah. like a, a fun action hero. And so collateral is just like, he's a fun, he's a, you know, he's an action hero. still. like, he's, he's pretty much Ethan Hunt, mm. but he's also a sociopath because he's just like, there's uh, the, 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 no, there's, no compunction about just killing people. No, and he and he and like he taps into like how Tom Cruise has no personality. He just kind of yeah. has like this caked on personality that Tom, like the thing I love about Tom Cruise is that he looks like he he just watched humans and was like, this is how a human is, and like that's how he acts. <laughs> but he didn't act like a real human. He just acts like what he thinks a human should act like, and I love that. About I mean, him. I guess that's what uh, that's what people have speculated about him since the whole like Scientology outburst thing that he's just like totally well, detached from well, think about it. That's, yeah but that's what makes like like i would say this this is in the same realm as like eyes wide shut and that's why yeah. it's great and eyes wide shut is that's because, why it's great yeah he's like a he's a person pretending to be a human um <laughs> but yeah and so it's it's so it's fantastic just for that because um you know, you have like all of these these set pieces that are set up like you would find in like a Mission Impossible movie or Top Gun or something like that, where it's like it's very um, it's very kinetic, it's very like physical, um, but it, you like kind of have to grapple with that. It. It's not he's not he's not the good guy in this, and like it, it's kind yeah. of like that it's that movie star playing against type. Um, Thing. He also yeah. doesn't look like he looks in most movies. Like usually he just shows up as Tom Cruise yeah, he's like playing a, a variation watcher. on himself. And yeah, he has the the kind of like Anderson Cooper hair and like a beard. Uh, he just I would like, like this if it was Anderson Cooper. <laughs> Anderson Cooper in Michael Mann's collateral. Yeah. yeah. But no, it, it, he's and he's great. I don't know, like there's something really effective about that. You know, I think um you mentioned before we, we started recording, um, training day and, and Denzel's yeah. great like Denzel like what's so great about Denzel in that movie is that he's Denzel um he's playing a Denzel character that like you enjoy Denzel in but he's a bad guy <laughs> he's yeah not a, he's not a good person and like it's always fun to see especially movie stars of the caliber of like Tom Cruise or Denzel who are like I it's the same thing I mean it's the same thing that people had when Leonardo DiCaprio played um Calvin Candy and Django and Chain, like you, when right. you have like this, this, this Uber movie star, like not just, not really like a, you know, we don't really have, like, I think we've talked about, it, like, we don't really have like a, this, I feel like a, a movie star, like up to that point anymore. So, you know, like if, mm-hmm. pe- like, people get excited when, like, Chris, you know, Chris Hemsworth's funny in something, but that's, a, you know, it's, I don't know, like, like they don't have like that distinct persona that you expect when you watch a movie right. that when they play against hype, it's super effective. 
that Tom Cruise has in Collateral or or Denzel has in like Training Day. Um, and like, and I think that's one of the things that that is so effective about the like star persona in movies is that whenever you have a star who will like take the time, you know, take the opportunity to do something like this, it's insanely effective because um, there is something too like you know, you like the movies where they play too tight because you are comfortable with them, you're familiar with them, and you like to see mm -hmm. that. But then it's also just always really entertaining to watch them play against type because they have like that. It's it's just it's like they're like it's like that other gear that the movie's working with where it's just messing with how you watch movies to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, and so collateral does a lot of that. I will say that despite the fact that I remember almost nothing about the plot of this movie, other than it's Tom Cruise holding Jamie Foxx hostage in a yeah. taxi. That's the um, movie. And, and the Tom Cruise is like evil um, is, is just, I, I remember nothing about it plot wise, but I remember the vibe. Like it's a really it's a vibe strong movie. vibe. I mean, Michael Mann, this is one of the things he does really well. Um, going back to his very first movie, Thief, which has that uh, Tangerine Dream score that's yes. just like really um, hypnotic, um, which is uh, oddly reminiscent of a movie that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But um, like I know that he's one of the um, kind of renowned on film Twitter for being one of the great users of digital cinematography. Um, movies like Miami Vice and Black yeah. Cat leaning really hard into, you know, what kinds of new images can we create with digital cinematography? And Collateral was one of his first experiments in that. And I think he's still kind of trying to um, ape the, um, I don't know, the, the classical look of celluloid film, mm -hmm. uh, but he's doing it um, in this, with these cameras that are like really crisp and like, uh, they, they capture these like really vivid colors um, and just like the nocturnal like urban landscape of this movie as it kind of flies by uh, from the window of the taxi is like just really um, undeniable. Well, it's, 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 it, I'm going to, you know, screw it up, but it has like that, uh, is it Chris Cornell? It has like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. It has a sound garden. Song. Yeah. yeah. And, it's just, and it's so weird. And I'm like, why yeah. is this in here? But it's amazing. Yeah. He's good at that. Like there's the yeah. um, Jay Z Lincoln park mashup that opened the yeah. director's cut of, or the theatrical cut of Miami vice. Um, you know, these like um, needle drops that feel like they don't belong in any movie, um, but they work in his specific register of movie. Absolutely. And, and so, yeah, this is, this is very much like a, a vibes movie where a lot of the entertainment just comes from uh, a lot of the entertainment just comes from like watching, like you said, like them driving in the car, the lights of like Los Angeles kind of passing by just like the, the like subtle looks that like Jamie Foxx and Tom Cruise give. Um, well, and you also, I forgot to mention this, you open the movie with this prolonged, uh, super romantic flirtation sequence between Jamie Foxx and Jada Pinkett Smith's character. Oh yeah, that is like straight up a incredibly effective little rom com that like is, um, place. is that over the phone? Is he talking to her? No, 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 she's in the cab with him. Oh, it's she's like, in the cab. Okay. Yeah, and it's like it's like fifteen, maybe I think I would say fifteen minutes, twenty minutes tops. Um, but it's like her getting in the cab and them just in the whole thing is that she says, Hey, go this route to my hotel. And he's like, Oh no, I'll, no, this is the fast, faster route. I'll take this. And they like make a bet. Um, <laughs> and it's just like this super cute, like give and take back and forth between the two of them um, before even like Tom Cruise even shows up. Um, that's also like, I don't know. You're just like, what, like what movie is this? Like, it's mm. like, you, you think you're about to have like a Jamie Foxx, Jada Pinkett Smith rom-com for a while. Um, you just reminded me of, of another movie um, that I'm not sure if people can watch or not, but um, Zach, did you ever get around to watching um, ETA, the movie that I, I scored for our friend Deja or my friend Deja? I think I, I've heard the music. It's not on YouTube. It might be on Vimeo. Anyways, like two years ago, I think, um, I scored a short mm -hmm. film uh, for my friend Deja mm -hmm. called ETA. And it's like, it's a shot and set in Nashville. And it's about like, um, 
uh, uh, like Uber, like the, it's a horror movie about like what could happen, what could go wrong in an Uber, you know, when you're Ubering home from a party and yeah. like, you're reminding me of it in that, like there's, it has the same plot, plot beat played very differently where she gets in the, the Uber and, and says, Hey, go this way. And he goes, no, I'm going to take you this way. Um, and it goes horribly, horribly wrong. But the reason I bring it up here is not just to kind of like pimp my own uh, uh, product that I, I helped create, um, but also that it kind of looks like Collateral. Like her cinematography has a very similar vibe. And I don't think Deja seen Collateral, but she uh, she just kind of like happened upon that look and it's really nice. Um, so if anyone's interested in, in watching a really good short film that I helped uh, make music for, um, you could do some searching for it. But it does not have any sound garden. No sound so. garden. No, I'm not on that level. You got to get up on that level. Mm -hmm. um, well, Collateral is on uh, Amazon Prime now. So if you have not seen it, there you go. Um, speaking of vibe movies, <laughs> <laughs> um, this I feel like this kind of got talked about a lot just for and gesturing, like everything around this actual movie. And then the movie came out. Oh, yeah. And after watching it, I'm going to be honest with Chris Nolan. Nobody would have liked this, even if it was in theaters. Mm. Well, so, it was. It was in theaters. If if it was like a normal, let me. So if it was a normal year of theaters, yeah. nobody would have liked this movie. Um, I liked it. So Tenet, <laughs> the latest Christopher Nolan movie, Tenet, because it's just so this movie. And honestly, I respect it. I respect it because it's just like Christopher Nolan. What goes? Do you want a plot? Throwing it away. <laughs> Do you want like cohesiveness? Just throw it away. All I'm giving you is boys and vibes. And I'm like, <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> so tenant again, I don't I don't I I like I kind of in a in a in a I like in the in the most basic sense, tenant is about you have John David Washington's character who's literally named protagonist. Um <laughs> Wait, no. Okay, so I've heard this as a meme, and I need to know to what extent it is true. Like, yeah, that's what, he walks, he has a birth certificate that says protagonist on it. Well, no, what, in what movie does somebody go, well, let me see your birth certificate? Well, no, no, that's what I'm asking. Like, <laughs> is it, is it some sort of weird, like, code name thing? Uh, is it, is it yeah. a dream logic thing? Um, what's going on there? See, that's, that you're asking too many questions for Tenet. That's, I'll be honest <laughs> with you. Um, <laughs> Because because the word tent he's literally his his only well I mean he has like guns and stuff but like his armor is he uses the word tenant and that like opens doors for him. Um, that's Excuse the me? that's the he, level he walks of, up to a door and says tenant and it opens. No, not not in a physical sense. It's like okay. you walk up to somebody and you work. It's hilarious. Like he works tenant into the like sentence that he says, and they're just like, oh, it's you, the protagonist. Um, oh. yeah. So the whole, is it like uh sorry, I have, I'm made of no, questions right now. Like, is I it, can't answer that. Okay. Is it like a, a simulation theory thing where like, he's one of the, everybody else is a non-playable character and he's one of the real people. Kind the, of, kind of. So like the whole, the whole thing with this movie is he's in like the real world, but the future is in <laughs> the future is in communication with the past or in this case the present and there it, it, it's like had it's like sent back in however way it, it describes I, I kind of forgot but like it, it, it for however it sends stuff back from the future to the present and you also have these machines that let you manipulate time and they're they're uh pretty much like the person who has all those machines is Kenneth Branagh, who's playing a Russian Bond villain, who's who's insanely misogynist. Um, he's great, not because he's a misogynist. He's just like he's super fun because he just fucking hate him the entire time. Um, but he has like these machines that you can go and like, like John David Washington will like be like will walk into a room and see like bullet holes. Like you've seen that poster, have you seen the or like not the poster, the trailer where like he there's like the, the glass and there's like the bullet holes in the glass. And so like you have this whole scene where he 
like walks into the room and those are already there. And then later in the movie, you he like enters the machine from the other way and comes out and it like play it like goes through the whole sequence of how those bullets got into the glass and like what happened because it's like you have the regular world and then you have the time like the future time world that is everything but in reverse and it's literally in reverse like everything is working like he has to like drive around and walk around and do all that stuff in reverse um i don't know if that answered your question no not even a little it's not let me just tell I, you. I now have so many questions that i don't even know how to ask them like i'll be honest with you like there's there's no reason i'll, I'll be like there's no reason to like firmly understand this movie. okay i don't think any like I don't, because again like it's not the point like christopher nolan is going i don't care about the plot i don't care about like anything cohesively coming together it's literally just like ideas and set pieces and vibes. Mm. And so you have John David Washington and in, it, it's pretty much a Bond movie. Like, so John David Washington is James Bond. You have Robert Pattinson as like, I guess James Bond's friend. I don't know really what his role would be in the- I wonder, I wonder if at one point this was an Idris Elba movie when, when everybody was trying to get Idris Elba to play Bond and the Bond people were like, no. Maybe Christopher hey, maybe. Nolan was like, I'll, I'll make your Bond movie, Idris Elba. I'm trying to think of who I'd like more. Maybe Idris Elba. John David Washington's fine. He's just mm -hmm. not very he's not very charismatic. His dad's so charismatic and he's just kind of bland. Mm -hmm. But it also might just be his roles. I don't know. Um Robert Pattinson's super good in this movie though. Robert Pattinson's super fun. He's just like because like the whole thing is they're just they're just buddies and they're just doing their time, their time heists. But like the the thing that makes this perfect for Christopher Nolan is he literally just like builds into this two and a half hour runtime, like his most insane set pieces that he's ever put on. Like, mm. like, like get Dunkirk out of here, get the dark Knight rises out of here, get inception out of here. That's like child's play. Like he goes hog wild on <laughs> this movie. Unlike set pieces. He lit. I mean, it was die like they talked about it before the movie came out, but he literally runs a plane into an air hanger. <laughs> For why you ask, I don't know. It was super cool though. It just blew mm -hmm. up. Um, he also has like a scene where John David Washington and Robert Pattinson like bungee jump off of a building and into like a market and they like get rid of the bungee cords and just walk. It's oh, it's great. <laughs> um, it's it's way too long. It's two and a half hours. It's way too long. Jeez. Yeah, that's it. Like. I'll, I'll, I'll probably end up watching this again at some point, but not anytime soon because you kind of have to commit to it because you, movies are too long when they make sense. Exactly. I can't, and, I can't imagine watching a two and a half hour long movie that doesn't make sense or well, one from Christopher Nolan anyways. Well, yeah. But so what you kind of have to do is you just have to like ride it. Like, it's just like, mm -hmm. you kind of have to just ride and like, again, you can't be like you are and like asking questions. No, no yeah. questions asking. Just like go, okay, this is what we're doing mm -hmm. and just go with it because you also, you, I mean, again, like I said, at its core, it's like a Bond movie. You have James Bond, who's John David Washington, and you have Kenneth Branagh's character, who's a mean, mean, rich person who wants to take, who wants to like blow up the world. And he has to stop Kenneth Branagh from blowing up the world. That's, if that's, if that helps anybody, that's what the plot of the movie is. But then there's a lot of other stuff happening around that. Mm -hmm. so I, I i enjoyed it, it kind of it's it's a, it's like a it's like a little bit james bond it's a little bit michael Mann. it's just it's very much just you know let's and you know honestly compared to like inception this movie is pretty good at like because instead of inception where he's like i'm gonna spend an hour explaining everything to you right he, he learned it just the lesson. doesn't he just goes i don't give a shit if you like if you like understand this right or not. we're just gonna go and like I love the script in this because there's it's there's lines in it that I think like I'm I'll just be I'll I'll just be judgy. A normal Christopher Nolan like fan person would come in and be like, "This is nonsense," but it's but it's supposed to be nonsense. Like none of these are like none of these people are supposed to be conversing in a way. It's kind of like we were talking about with Tom Cruise. None of these people are supposed to be conversing in a way that's like actual conversation that like mm. an actual person would be speaking. It's all just in this like weird, like, what are you talking about? 
speech pattern that I right. find that's, that like, honestly, most of this movie is unintentionally hilarious because you're just like, what are you talking? Like, I mean, you have the whole, we live in a, twi in a twilight world that everybody keeps saying to one another. And you're like, what are you talking about? But Wait, that, that literal line is said, we live in a twilight world. Well, I say that constantly. Oh, which, okay. That's like the whole, like, that's like the, um, like the whole, like, we live in a twilight world. And they're like, oh, it's that guy. I've heard this movie discussed so much um, that I, I figure that like, there's not even any point in me watching it anymore. But the more you talk about it, the more I'm like, oh, that's, it's that's a, a thing in this movie. It's a fun experience. Like, again, like it's like, a, it's a fun experience because it doesn't make any damn sense. And, but it also is like fully like aware of that it's like, yeah, no, no, it's just, it's just nonsense, man. Like just enjoy it. And so you just kind of like take in the set pieces, you take in the nonsense Robert Pattinson's is, is pretty fun. Like he seems like he's having a good time. Kenneth Branagh's having way too good of a time. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a good, it's a good one. It's on uh, HBO and HBO Max right now. So there you go. Okay. Yeah, it's you nice. don't even have to put you know people at risk to watch it anymore. Now it would have been a like I'll say it would have been amazing to do like the whole Christopher Nolan treatment where you go to like an IMAX theater and see this because again the mm. set pieces are insane. Was it shot in IMAX? No, he didn't shoot it like he's been shooting the other ones. Okay. Um, but it's still like it, it like it, this was like a this is a good movie theater movie. Right. I still I still contend that nobody would have liked it, but it would have been more entertaining at a movie theater. Oh no, he didn't shoot it on IMAX. He shot it on film, right? He's been he's been doing that lately. Uh, there you go. Um, it's, it, I can't even imagine like all right, we're gonna shoot it on film. You got to say we're in a Twilight world, like. Eight <laughs> With a straight face, you can't laugh at it. Um, well, all right. Well, I enjoy my toss over to you. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of vibes, I have a good vibe movie for everyone. It's more of a bad vibe than a good yeah. vibe, but it is a strong vibe. Um, and that this, is the this, movie. This episode of Cemetery brought to you by Vibes. Brought to you by Vibes, man. Uh, and PBR. This movie is Prince of Darkness by one John Carpenter. Uh, this came out in 1987. Um, my frame of reference for this movie is I've heard it talked about as um, the final, I think the final movie chronologically in, in what some people call John Carpenter's Lovecraft trilogy um, with The Thing um, and uh, In the Mouth of Madness and then this movie. Um, and of the three movies, this is the one that's the most abstract um, it, it is with the thing, you know, all these movies are kind of dealing with unknown, um, like unknown antagonistic forces, because that's kind of what Lovecraft is. Um, but I would say that in the thing and Prince of Darkness, there's much more of a concrete, like the audience kind of has a concrete understanding of like what the actual threat is, you know, in the thing, there's some sort of alien virus that's constantly mutating in mm -hmm. the mouth of madness. There's this cult that's spreading and this madness that's spreading. And then the mouth of, or in, um, sorry, what's the name of the movie I'm talking about? Prince of Darkness. Prince of Darkness. It's, um, on the <laughs> it's, it's on the banner. <laughs> in Prince of Darkness, it's kind of unclear what the actual like dark force that is being unleashed is. Um, I wrote in my letterbox review of this movie, I quoted um, the critic Adam Naiman, um, who recently got on, got, went viral accidentally on Twitter, asking people, you know, what are some examples of truly evil movies? He said, not necessarily in terms of depicting it or thematizing it with ideology or politics, but that truly feel like they're channeling something awful into the world. Um, and, and he said that he was inspired to ask the question by the movie uh, Sporlus or uh, The Vanishing, which I strongly agree with him is like a movie with a very dark aura <laughs> around it, around it. Like it will, it'll mess you up a little bit, mm -hmm. that movie. Um, but Prince of Darkness, I would say, belongs in that same conversation. I didn't see a lot of people citing it in the replies, but I, it definitely feels that way to me. The basic plot of the movie is... Um, we have these academics uh, who study like quantum physics and we have these religious scholars and members of the church that are both kind of gathered to the same place. Um, this old decrepit church that looks like it's hundreds of years old um, where there's some sort of presence in the basement of the church. Um, sure. And it's not like a presence as in like there's a ghost 
Um, or God. And, or, 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 or God, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe closer to Satan. Um, mm. But it's actually like this canister. Like there's this, there's this glowing green canister that's Ghost been Busters. in the bottom of this basement. Wait, what was that? I said it's Ghostbusters. It's Ghostbusters. Um, there's this also, glowing green also canister. Also an yeah. evil movie. <laughs> well, yeah, that unleashed a different type of evil into the exactly. world. The evil of fanboys. <laughs> <laughs> this movie there's this there's this glowing green canister that has this like weird um like liquidy gas stuff inside it i can't really describe it but it looks like it's kind of rushing upwards and and glowing and it's like almost like kind of like a really fast moving lava lamp or something um and apparently this is like a a secret of the churches that they've kind of been keeping under wraps for a long time and for some reason it's now kind of like becoming uncontrollable and it's it um the some of the things that you see happen with this canister are really wild like um and, and things that are very hard to describe um mm -hmm. like there's this there's this really incredible image where um you see liquid flying up into the air um mm -hmm. and it's unclear where the liquid's even coming from but people look up in the air and they see the ceiling is made of this green liquid um, which is obviously like they just shot it. They shot a floor and they mm -hmm. flipped it. But the way that it works kind of physically in the movie is, is really disorienting. Um, and there's, there's all this stuff about, you know, uh, the, the church covering up like the story, the story of Satan being kind of like a fiction. And like, there's a real story that, that people don't want to get out, but now maybe it's time for it to get out. And I feel like I'm doing a, a, a poor job explaining what this is because it, it is best left unexplained because the kinds of things that you see are sort of unexplainable. There's like a lot of different disparate phenomena that don't seem to all cohere, um, but it all kind of feels um, coherent in, in a way that you can't quite um, uh, like wrap your head around. It reminds me a little bit of um, this great David Lynch quote um, where he says, well, he was asked like where his ideas come from. He said that like he imagines himself in a room and, like with a door and every day under the door, somebody like slips him a puzzle piece, but he imagines that the puzzle is already finished in the other room. Mm -hmm. um, and, and like, that's kind of the vibe I get watching this movie. Like I'm getting these little clues of what's going on in the other room, but I'm never fully given the, the full picture, but I, I get the sense that it does have a complete, a complete puzzle over there somewhere. Um, and the main reason I want to recommend this movie um, is not just for like the very interesting way that it handles like the Lovecraftian narrative of the, you know, the sphere of the unknown, um, but specifically the music in this movie is incredible. Um, I think John Carpenter is really underrated weirdly as a composer. I mean, I think a lot of people know is he's it? a composer. Um, you know, Halloween is one of the the most iconic uh, horror scores of all time and he he puts yeah. out music on vinyl and he tours and stuff like that i was gonna um, say i feel like people i don't know i mean i don't like, know what's wrong I mean, with you if you're underrated him? <laughs> i don't think that um i don't think that people you know when they talk about john carpenter as a composer i don't think people sure. are like yeah he's not that great i i think what i'm saying is like when people have conversations about the greatest composers they tend to to cite people like bernard herman and john williams and people like that. And I don't feel like I ever hear John Carpenter brought up in those conversations. Um, well, really, you, you, I guess when you think of composer, you're thinking more in like a classical sense. And he's like, right. He's, really he's like a, music. he's like a synth rock musician, yeah. but his compos his, his film scores are incredible. And I think yeah. this is like hands down his best film score. Like it's better than the Halloween score by by like a mile. And the Halloween score is amazing, right? And the reason that that I would say that this is better is um, like like the main the main thing that makes it more powerful as a score is that it is constant. Like the score starts when the movie starts and the score never stops. Never. Like I think there are a couple of like 10 second periods, like maybe two 10 mm -hmm. second periods where there's no music. But with the exception of those periods, it is like one composition that is building and building and building and building for 90 minutes. And it's amazing. 
Um, and like, it kind of goes into different movements and different moods and, and uh, you know, uh, it, it is working in different chord progressions and things like that, but it all feels of a piece. And it's like, it is, I would say the main thing that kind of keeps the audience enraptured throughout this movie. Like there are a lot of stretches of this thing where I didn't quite know what was going on or where the plot wasn't really moving forward all that much. It was kind of cutting back and forth between various people doing uh, kind of repetitive things in, in different rooms. But I was still just like really caught up in it uh, because the score kind of like the Suspiria score just kind of pulls you in. And I, I would, I would also like compare this favorably to, um, you know, Dario Argento's Suspiria. Like it, it has a similar mm -hmm. vibe to it um, in, in that it is driven by vibes uh, and, and is able to kind of spin suspense, suspense and tension out of essentially nothing. Um, like think about that scene in Suspiria where like there's a girl who's stuck in a room and she's being chased by something, but you don't know what. And there, the thing that's chasing her like sticks a knife under the door to like try to lift the latch. And it like keeps cutting back to it, like trying to lift the latch over and over. And it like, it kind of doesn't make sense, but somehow you still feel kind of scared and kind of worried. Um, a similar uh, dynamic is happening in Prince of Darkness. It's, it's really, really good. Like it's just great filmmaking. Um, and I would, I would say it's like, among the best John Carpenter movies. I, I can't decide if it's my favorite John Carpenter movie. It's probably, I, I would say that like the the three Lovecrafty ones, The Thing in the Mouth of Madness and this one are all kind of like gunning for my number one John Carpenter spot, but it is a really strong contender. So I, if people have not watched it, they definitely should. Has John Carpenter ever worked? This is unrelated. Has John Carpenter ever worked with Nicolas Cage? No, he has not. But that it would is. be that wild. Been, I don't know if well, does John Carpenter directing movies anymore. That would have been fun. No, um, I don't know. Every so often, I see like John Carpenter interview quotes come across my Twitter timeline, and it seems like he's just enjoying royalty checks. <laughs> like, which uh, honestly, people, we all would be. I saw one recently where somebody was like, "Do you ever miss those days when you were?" you know, making all these great movies like Halloween and they live and escape from New York. Do you miss those, that, that was glory days of just like making stuff. And he was like, no, making stuff's hard. I would rather stay home and get free money. <laughs> dude, that's, dude, like, no, I, I love John Carpenter because now all he does is like sits at home and plays video games and watches NBA games. That sounds yeah. like an amazing life. What was the video game that people were talking about him being obsessed with? I feel like it was like a, a, one of the Sonic game, like one of the bad Sonic something games. like that. But yeah. like I've seen, I've seen an interview where he's just like, "Yeah, I like playing video games. I like to watch some NBA games later, and that's like what I want to mm -hmm. do." I'm like, "Hell yeah, that's like an awesome life." Good. Yeah, he's living his best life. Yeah, but anyway, like that would have been cool if Nicolas Cage and John Carpenter made a movie. M never say never, I suppose. Um, sure. Though I guess um, I feel like at this stage of Nick Cage's career, he's like way too in on the joke for. Um, yeah, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be fun. Yeah, like I hear, I really was excited about his movie that he made with Sion Sono, um, and I, reviews out of wherever it came out, TIFF maybe, um, no. made it made it seem kind of insufferable. Yeah, yeah. no, it seemed you know. It is what it is. Anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Are we at the end of part one or should we, uh, do we have time for one more? What do you think? Eh, at 37. Yeah, let's end it. Let's end it there. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and then we will be back talking about the prodigy in part two. Stick around. Hey, Ron. Hi. Oh, hi. Is Ron there? He, yeah, he's commenting. I'll just, you can just listen I don't see to it. This. No, he's there. He's you're, he's commenting in the Patreon post, not on YouTube, um, so we can't see it. So if you comment in the YouTube video, you can talk to us. Luckily, I got the little message. I have a um, little editing task for you. Sorry. Oh, nice. um, when we were talking about, I think it was in the middle of the tenant conversation. I think, I, yeah, it was when I asked about the the simulation theory thing. I accidentally pulled the cord out of my mic and it stopped recording on Audacity, but I got it re-recording. You just need to stitch it together. Oh, that'll be fine. Yeah, that's yeah. easy. That's what you get for questioning the logic. That's right. I, uh, it was a glitch in the no matrix. Logic. 
There is, there's just no logic. It's just nonsense. Yeah. I'm going to go to the bathroom. Maybe Ron can figure out the comment system before I get Yeah, back. you figure out the comment section, Ron. <laughs> I'll just, up, up, he's gone. I guarantee he's what he's doing. I'm just going to talk to the other people who are listening or watching it like later. What he's doing is he's, he's trying to figure out how to get into YouTube. I guarantee he's sitting with patreon.com slash cinematary up and he's clicked the play button and he's watching it through there, but he's, and so he just, Ron, what you gotta do is you gotta click on, you gotta watch it in YouTube. So you gotta click on like, I think there's a little YouTube button. I mean, I'm gonna look at it. There's a little YouTube button on the top, man. Uh, I'm going to walk you through this while while you're while you're here. So when you click on the on the thing, yeah yeah yeah. So like yeah yeah. yeah. So you got so what you got to do is you got there's a bull button down there. It says watch on YouTube.com. You got to click that and then you'll watch it in YouTube and then you can comment there. Yeah. Thank you for this watching and you got to enjoy my explaining how to watch a YouTube tutorial to run. He'll figure it out. What is this? That's hilarious. What's this? Oh, that's fun. Can I add one? Oh man, I got an upgrade. That's hilarious. Oh, I kind of like that bubble. Ooh, I like the bubble. Minimal. That's just what I was doing. Now I'm gonna go with bubble. Bubble. Oh, there he goes. See, you got it, Ron. Look at you. Look, I'm going to put it on the screen. There he is. Look at you. Here's your comment, you little dummy. Here you go. <laughs> I'm going to leave this for Andrew. He'll appreciate this. This is like a, it's like a, like somebody stuck in a box. Am I, <laughs> it's very existential. Am I here? Are you there? Are any of us anywhere? Did I enter this house? With a box, or was it with a fox? Oh. Look at this. This this is this is quality. It's quality stuff. We're enjoying the ambiance of a Savannah night. That's is this a gunshot or is it fireworks? That might be fireworks. Nah, that sounds like a good shot. It's a good shot. Do I get my minutes up? Yeah. Look, we oh, got. Look, he figured he, it out. He figured it out. Look, it, look, he's like existential. It's like he, it's very <laughs> Who am I? Are, am I here? Are you there? Are any of us anywhere? Yeah. Oh, I like that it shows up on the uh, the little YouTube video. It's kind of, yeah, it's fun. Though, Look, um, I made... You know, there was the one time where I was commenting while you guys were doing the, um, I forget what episode it was. It was in the food series. Yeah. Uh, Hero Dreams of Sushi. That was the one. Um, and it the comment showed up like two minutes after I left the comment. And so like by the time I was trying to like correct people on things and I would be correcting them in the middle of like five thoughts later and I would totally derail the conversation. That's, luckily that's not going to happen with Ron. He's, you know, he's going to be really on top of it and it'll, there'll be no delays. Yeah. Yeah. Like I made our names in bubbles. I was, I was having a lot of fun. Oh, look at that. But look at it. You want to see that? I was also playing with this. You ready? That's fun. 
I need but, I need that. I have kind of like a countdown thingy for my uh, my Dark Souls stream, but it's it's not that easy. I can't just click a button and make it start. It's a whole like coding thing you got to do. It's annoying. Yeah, that's why I like StreamYard because it's basic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Don't have to work that hard. Right. All right, let's talk about this fucking Prodigy. <laughs> Stupid ass movie. By the way, I think I maybe already told you this, but I'm pretty sure, like 95% sure, the person who um, gave us this is a former student of mine. So I can talk a little bit about why I think they asked me to do it. Um, well, they stopped being a patron, so I'm, I, I feel no remorse in shit talking this <laughs> Well, I'm probably going to be their teacher again next year, so I, I will face that sounds awkward. That sounds awkward to you. <laughs> I got no recourse on that. Be like, sorry, you got bad taste. Watch Rosemary's Baby like a normal person. <laughs> All right. There we go. In three, two, one. And we are back with part two of episode 352 of Cinematary. In this part, we will be doing our first of two weeks of Patreon picks. This one is for The Kittiest of Kittens, and uh, it's 2019's The Prodigy. Uh, directed by Nicholas McCarthy from a script by Jeff Bueller. The film stars Taylor Schilling, Jake Jackson, Robert Scott, Peter Mooney, and Colm Four. Sarah and John Bloom are thrilled when their young son, Miles, starts to show signs of rapid development and extreme intelligence. Their family bliss soon turns to a living nightmare when Miles' behavior becomes increasingly erratic and violent by his eighth birthday. After seeking help from two experts, Sarah is horrified to learn that her beloved prodigy may be under the grip of a dark and supernatural force. Chilling on her character in the film, quote, I think she's fighting for her son and she feels a tremendous amount of responsibility for her child. And the intensity of the circumstances aren't something that everyone can relate to, but her instinct to be her son's guardian and do whatever it takes to make sure that he's safe, that he blossoms in the world is really what I think a lot of parents can relate to. In October of 2018, McCarthy revealed the scene had to be re-edited in the movie after it was found that it made a test audience scream so much that they missed the following dialogue. He added, quote, four years ago, I went, I was sent a script for this movie. For the first half, I was thinking, wow, this is a really interesting and creepy and twisted variation on the evil kid subgenre. But then the script just went to this place that I couldn't believe. That's what made me go from, here's a movie I think might be cool, to here's a movie that's gotta be made. The film includes an interview with another family who believed their child had memories of a previous life that was actual footage of a real interview with James Lineker, whose parents believed his nightmares about plane crashes were caused by having had a previous life as a World War II pilot. In 2019, the New York Times said the movie's occasional chills do little to obscure the thin plotting, problematic pacing, and a central mystery that's left aggravatingly vague. Uh, In 2019, the LA Times said a tense and gripping, persuasively acted horror thriller that evokes such evil child flicks as The Omen, The Exorcist, The Bad Seed, and The Good Son, while carving its own pulse-pounding, if inherently far-fetched, niche in the process. And in 2019, the uh, Hollywood Reporter said, struggling throughout with issues of structure and pacing, Nicholas McCarthy's horror feature threatens to debase standards for the genre to levels that even undiscriminating thrill seekers seem likely to reject. Wow. Man, I've never panned a film that hard. That's that's rough. I, I added that one because I was like, that's pretty good. That was a good one. <laughs> And somewhere probably Peter Travers was like levels of amazing. depravity. Wait, what was the what was the line again? Oh, it wasn't depravity. Threat, threatens to dis- cool. threatens uh, Nicholas McCarthy's horror feature threatens to debase standards for the genre to levels that even undiscriminating thrill seekers seem likely to reject. Debasing the standards of the genre. Wow. The subgenre of evil kids. I mm. like in the one review where they just name every other evil kid movie that's actually good, like The Omen, mm-hmm. The Exorcist. Like, man, yeah, like, duh. is The Omen actually good? I've never seen The Omen. It's better than this. <laughs> <laughs> the Prodigy, twenty nineteen. Let's talk about it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's dumb, uh, Andrew. Why did your <laughs> Why did your student make us watch this piece yeah. of shit movie? Yeah. I'm- <laughs> I mean, I should say at the at the front end, I don't have confirmation. Sorry, piece that, of crap movie. That uh, it's fine. Uh, that this that this movie was uh, given to us by a student of mine. However, I am like 
95 to 99% certain I know uh, the person who recommended this. Was it a student um, who was possessed by a <laughs> past life? Yes, because he's possessed by a, uh, a, a deranged film critic from a past life, and he's trying to torment other film critics from beyond Colin the grave. Colin Kale came beyond, from beyond the grave <laughs> to torture us with this piece of shit movie. Uh, so, and the reason I think that it is the student is because a, um, I know this student has a particular interest in sociopathy. Um, not to say this student is a sociopath. I do not think they are. Um, however, I know that it's like of academic interest to them, right? Like whenever that's I was- That's what it always is. <laughs> that's, that's what they all say. Um, whenever we would, you know, be talking about uh, like character motivation and stuff when we're analyzing stories in class, you know, I would ask things like, you know, why did this character do this? And, and this student would be like, well, because they're a sociopath. And like, that would be, Fair. that would be a thing that they would, a well that they would go back to again and again. Um, and a lot of times it was valid. Um, sometimes it was not. Uh, but I was watching this and I was like, oh yes, a movie that is appealing to someone who is like deeply interested in the idea of sociopaths, right? Um, I have also they seen the other movies that like I mentioned, like, have they seen like, well, the those movies are a little different, right? Where it's, um, well, they're good. Yeah. They're, these are movies about like the supernatural and, and, you know, evil, evil, unexplainable demonic forces of kind of like taking hold of children. And this movie is doing something slightly different where it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's an adult, it's a calculated adult mind that has found itself inside a, uh, a a kid's body, and so when I was watching this, I actually wasn't thinking about um, the Omen and the Exorcist. I was thinking about two very specific movies um, that came out in like the ten years leading up to this movie, which are we need to talk about Kevin um, yeah. and Orphan. Which yeah, I, I know you've one. seen the former. Have you seen Orphan too, Zach? Yeah, I watched Orphan with you, man. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yes, yes. Um, so yeah, I definitely <laughs> felt like. This is a movie that saw the director saw both of those movies, or the screenwriter saw both those movies and thought, I could do that. <laughs> well, um, the director clearly did not because he watched <laughs> this was like, holy shit, yeah. what is this? And like the the key difference is filmmaking, right? <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. sorry. Uh we yeah. talk about Kevin has this like really kind of poetic, elliptical, um Hard, hard to pin down like editing and cinematography style where everything is kind of glanced at from this, this askew angle. Um, and, and you're like not, you're questioning reality. Um, it's very much like a psychological character study of the person whose perspective you're seeing all this from. Yeah. Um, and then Orphan is much more of a, you know, a, a pulpy, you know, uh, a sleazy thriller. Um, but it's shot like in a way that I would compare to like James Wan or something where it's just like very muscular, like hardworking camera work. Like it's the, the camera is always placed in these really striking, powerful places. And the camera moves are all like really impactful on the audience too. And just, everything kind of is like so um, like uh, 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 premeditated for like maximum, like, uh, um, I don't, I don't know the word I'm looking for here, but just like keeping like the thrill. audience. Thrill. Yeah, it's a thrill. Yeah. thrill. It's, yeah. it's what this movie would like to be, you know, mm -hmm. because like it constantly is, is setting itself. Like when it sets up a, like a, a scare or whatever, it like pays it off. This one, the, the, the whole movie, it's, you know, you kind of have like that cliche where you're like, oh, this movie, this horror movie is terrible because you can kind of just guess what's going to happen. This movie's kind of like that, though. Like, this movie like, tells you what's going to happen. Like, yeah, it's I just guess telegraphing I was confused, everything. I was confused for a minute at the beginning whenever it's like, at, so the prologue of the movie, I guess before the title card drops um yeah is they're cutting back and forth between these two you know seemingly unrelated events a woman who escapes from a house and she doesn't have a hand anymore and then another woman who's about to give birth to a child yeah. um and she and like it does <laughs> the child has a hand she as they hand. want to do um uh, or yeah she also has a hand um and and very quickly into the movie like i don't know 15 20 minutes 
it becomes very clear that like, oh, the uh, the the guy who cut her hand off died and was reincarnated into this child. Yeah. And then there's like 30 to 45 minutes of them litigating that. And the characters also finding out, oh, this, you know, my child is the reincarnated spirit of this like, you know, 40 year old serial killer. And these dumb parents, like, he he takes like what was without a wrench. He hits a child with a wrench, mm-hmm. and they don't go. Eh, something might be wrong with him. <laughs> yeah, I mean to to their credit, um, mm. the proposition, the explanation that's provided to them is so outlandish that I think any parent would be like, "Get out of here!" Like I, I'm not listening to that. You know, immediately they bring her in here with like this, you know, reincarnation expert. Who's like, I figured out what's wrong with your son. It's reincarnation. I'd be like, no, no, like thank just you. Find that Goodbye. Guy. Well, it reminded me. Oh, shoot. What is that? What is that? Oh, oh, it reminded me of um, of uh, of uh, Return to Oz. It reminded me of Return oh, to I'm Oz. I've not seen Return to Oz. When they, so in Return to Oz, when they send Dorothy to like the, um, the like uh, the, the asylum place, like it just reminded me of that, where it's like, this seems like a stretch. <laughs> like this. <laughs> <laughs> you could have taken some other steps before you took this step. This mm-hmm. seemed like a rush. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it is it like it telegraphs everything in this movie. Like, so even if you wanted to be scared, like what, what, what test audience was so stupid that they like got okay. afraid in this movie? Can I, because, can I tell you a moment that scared me in this movie? But, but it was a moment where my fear was immediately replaced with laughter. Like I was genuinely scared for a second. And then I was like, Oh, is it when it turned in that guy's face? Yes. It's it's when the kid is sitting in a chair facing away from the camera and he turns around and he has the face of the old guy. That part was hilarious. (laughs) It was really frightening because I wasn't expecting it. And then it was hilarious. Immediately. It was hilarious. I don't think I was afraid. Like it was more like, what the hell? And so mm-hmm. then I had to like rewind it, it back. It just feels and, wrong. And I, and I paused it and I was just like, oh, all right. Which, you know, there's another movie that does a similar scare much better, which is The Others. Have you seen The Others? Yes. That? That's yeah. A, the, that's a very the, effective scare. The scare where the, the little girl is like wearing a bridal veil and underneath the bridal veil, it's like an old woman's face. It's like, ugh, it's, it's horrifying. Yeah. Um, this was not that. It was more so, just like, oh. And then it was like, hmm. Speaking of the face swap scare. Um, I have a qualm with this movie, which is that the movie um, does okay. not, does not really like play by its own rules. If you know what I mean, right. You know, this is a movie with like this supernatural conceit where somehow for reasons, because wizards, um, the, this old serial killer dude, or actually no, the reason that he's able to reincarnate is because the whole like unfinished business narrative, right? The same reason that people say people come back as ghosts. They, they died and they had unfinished business. He had unfinished business. He chopped this lady's hand off and he was going to kill her, but he never got to kill her. So God decided, sure, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you go kill her. Uh, God was sleeping that day. He was like, I did. (laughs) Yeah. He's like sorting souls. He's like, ah, that one can go back uh, without really thinking that hard about it. Um, But yeah, like we have this rule that like he comes back and he's in the kid's body. It's a kid's body and it's a, it's a serial killer spirit inside. That's all. That's the only thing that's happening. But there are a couple moments where it becomes more supernatural than that for reasons that do not seem consistent with the rules of the movie, like the face swap scare. Why is it that for a second, the mom can see the serial killer's face on the sun? He's not a shapeshifter. It's this is not how this works. There's also the there's the um there's another scare too that's like there's a there's a weird there's a weird supernatural element to it as well. Like he gives yeah. her bad dreams or something, like he's standing over her bed giving her bad dreams. Yeah. Um, see, I, I hear you. Um yeah. I just cared so <laughs> <laughs> like I hear you and you're right. But, yeah, uh, I just cared so little. I was like, whatever, you do what you need to do. You yeah, get me through this. Um, no, but I it, it 
honestly, like I would have been happier if it just leaned into let's let's understand the mumbo jumbo. Like what it yeah. like let's really just get into this. But it like wants this like because it does, it like wants to lay out this like if you were a parent who had a you know child who was possessed by a serial killer, what would you do? Like that's the lesson it wants you to kind of pre present you yeah. with. I'm like, and I'm like, that's stupid. So like, I would have just leaned into the mumbo jumbo mm -hmm. and just like really went with that. But instead they want to like make it a parable and it's a terrible yeah. parable. Cause like, um, and when you talk about Kevin and an orphan, like those are both really thematically dense movies about motherhood. Um, sure. And, and about this like- is nothing about motherhood. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, those movies are, they legitimately do tap into the idea of like, you know, worrying about what if my kid is awful, you know, what, what if it comes out wrong yeah. uh, or what if I mess it up, you know, and this movie doesn't really do that. It's like, no, what if my kid was possessed by a serial killer. <laughs> and yeah. it's also like, it's not particularly thoughtful about like sociopathy either. I don't feel like, you know, it's just like, you know, some people kill people because they want to kill people. And that's, this guy just you know, this is like, Chucky He's, level stuff. Uh, he speaks Hungarian, you know. I'm right. Like, oh, all right. Like, why did why did Hungary get dragged in this? You know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> what did Hungary do wrong? Yeah. Just, <laughs> I like that. Also, like when he goes to see the psychiatrist guy, and he just starts speaking Hungarian. He's like, "How do you speak Hungarian?" And, like, and I the know, guy, I learned like, it for you. <laughs> but when you, the proper response was. Why did you even know that I was speaking? Like, what? Like, what? Why would you know that? Like, what? Why are we? Why are any of us speaking Hungarian right now? Oh, also in the psychiatrist scene, um, the kid leaves a secret message for the psychiatrist by scratching a name into the leather couch and while the kid is having a fit of some sort. When like the two spirits are battling in his head, mm -hmm. how does a kid with one hand like? clearly scratch a name into leather couch with with his fingernails well he has two hands he's not the but he does it with one it's only on one couch cushion oh i don't know how he scratched the name that's that was pretty <laughs> bullshit you know again i was just like whatever you work with whatever you need to work with what what is it 70 minutes all right i got 20 left mm -hmm. um so i want to dig in on the I mean, it's, the whole thing's stupid, but like the stupidity of the ending of this movie. So let oh me just my set, gosh. Yeah. so let's set up the ending. So by this point, he has crashed his dad into a uh, into a. Well, first he stabs him with because there's just tools lying all over the place. This he morning. always has shears. Yeah, like like reason. like like one parenting one on one. Keep the shears away. From <laughs> but he just has those everywhere. He's just also, like oh. Like, he uses the shears to cut the dog's paw off. Did I miss something? I feel like there was the dog hanging out in the hallway scene. And then next thing you know, they find the dog dead and rotting in the tool room. I don't, it's, is it a shed? Is it a basement? Is it a garage? Unclear. Um, well, was there any point where the, the parents are like, where'd the dog go? I feel yeah. like that never happened. Well, they had the whole scene where he's like, where did the dog go? And then they drive him around and the dad, and that's when he's like, why did your dad beat you? And his dad's just like, what the hell? Yeah. And then, um, but also, then you also have the scene with the babysitter where she like walks downstairs and somebody pointed this out in the letterbox review. So mm -hmm. I'm stealing from them, okay. but, and no, let's just like, I, I hate getting into like, well, in a logical world because it's a movie, but also like the light's not working because he unscrews the light bulb you got a cell phone. Like you're not going in there in the pitch black. What are you talking about? You also, would see the glass. To make another comparison, and this is not even a movie I like, but did this movie come out after A Quiet Place? I think it came out after A Quiet Place, which does Maybe. the same slowly walking down the stairs and stepping on a sharp object. It trip. did. It came yeah. out a year after. Yeah, that's just a blatant ripoff right there. And you're ripping off John Krasinski. He rips <laughs> off everybody. Yeah, I mean, God. when you rip off Lynn Ramsey, I have a little respect for you. Yeah, but but don't rip off John, John Krasinski. John Krasinski. <laughs> God. Anyway, so the end of this movie. So the dad is like incapacitated, but he was pretty boring and pretty milk toast anyway. So whatever. He was um, my favorite character. He seemed like a good dad. He did. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was milk toast. That made him a bad person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. So the mom. Her plan is that, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so she learns that the serial killer is inside her son. 
Right. So what she does is she goes with him for whatever reason to a pawn Why shop. Why does she take him with her? <laughs> to a pawn shop. Anyway, again, I don't know. What like they're bad parents. What what are you gonna do? Um and then so then she gives him sleeping pills to drive him out to like because of course this lady like lives within sleeping pill driving distance from them. Mm. Um unless he just took sleeping pills a lot. <laughs> I don't know. And so, so so her plan is I'm going to like, go and also does does the mom communicate ahead of time that she's coming to see this woman because no, when they she get does not. there um that woman is confused. The, as you should. Yeah, but like they're talking on weirdly familiar terms like like this woman knows what you know the main character's problem is. It's, well, the, it's well, weird. The, well, she she kind of is like, oh, it's another person who's like obsessed with my story because like, because oh, I guess yeah. I guess she had like that makes sense. It had been documented that yes. she, what what she went through. So she, but still, you shouldn't invite this person in. She's a stranger. No, no. you know, whatever. This um, poor woman, by the way. Yeah, she so says the, like, so pretty much. I, I have a rule about not letting people into my house, and this woman's like, please, just this once. I need, I, I, I I'm unsafe, and I need sanctuary or whatever. Yeah, and like immediately like the first person you let in your house after breaking your own rule, like pulls a gun on you. <laughs> so, so the, the, let me just, the thought process of this mom is I'm going to kill this woman yes. so that I, so that then the spirit will feel like cleansed or what, you know, like his unfinished he, business he'll, he'll, his, he'll be all finished and he'll yeah. leave and I can have my son. But first, the hell is wrong with you? You're just gonna kill this woman, but it, but then she like gets second thoughts because the woman goes, "Oh yeah, like I have a husband and a son, but I don't like you know I don't want to drag them into this crap, and so I did I don't really talk about them." And she's like, "Oh shit, like I can't kill this woman, right? She has a she has a husband and a son, but I'm, to me I was like, her. you shouldn't have killed her. You shouldn't be killed trying to kill her beforehand. So then naturally, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna spoil it because you shouldn't watch this, but." Um, <laughs> So then the kid naturally wakes up from like the longest sleeping pill of all time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or maybe never took the sleeping pill at all. That too. I mean, the mom was way too trusty in that situation. Yeah. And he just, just, just slices her, her slice the woman up and she's dead. Um, and then, and then honestly, a little bit comedic, the mom then chases the child out into the field and na a, a very natural reaction when she's pointing a gun at him and is about to kill him. Some other person is rightfully went, what the hell is going on over there? And it's shoots her. Deus ex machina thing where <laughs> yeah. she gets killed instead of the kid. And like, I'm also thinking logistically from the mom's perspective, I know I'm trying to like save my son from the yeah. supernatural serial killer who reincarnated into his body as one does, but also like, I am just I just became responsible for the death of a of a famous woman. How am I gonna cover that up? Right? Sure. No attempt is even mentioned. Um, and then now I'm gonna decide to kill my own son. I mean, I guess the other the what step three is I'm gonna kill myself, right? Because there's no way out of this. Yeah. But um it, if if that's not the thing that she does, like where do you was, go from here? How do you go from life out, after that? It yeah. wasn't a thought out plan. It wasn't a good plan. It was a bad plan. And she kind of, you know. So then like it ends and it's like he's with this like kind of foster family or something. But his dad's still there. I mean, his dad's still alive. He's, he's not going to be not going to be thrilled. He's not going to be thrilled when he gets out if he does. But I would also say to back up just a little bit, you skipped over what would be a perfectly fine ending. And then they give you another shot that would be a perfectly fine ending and then they give you a third ending which sucks <laughs> yeah uh, the first perfectly fine ending is you know the hunter guy who just so happened to be standing over there kills the mom <laughs> yeah. and he like goes back into the like i'm a little baby act and runs up to the hunter <laughs> and, and you get the sense like oh he's just gonna do it again right um, yeah. and then you get another scene that's communicating the exact same thing they take him to a foster home and it, and like he sees his new foster like mom I'm a little baby. and, and you, I'm a little baby and <laughs> you get, you get a, a, a close up shot on this woman's hands because you know, he has this kink for cutting off women's hands Look out. and it would, and then you get like a, a diabolical smile from the kid and the movie could end there. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to kink shame that one. Um, <laughs> 
The movie, <laughs> if the, your kink is cutting off hands, I feel like you should be ashamed. It. Only consensual hand cutting off. Yeah. Please. Make sure you uh, ask him. And sometimes not even then, you know. Um, but then the movie could end there on the shot of the hand, and it doesn't. It goes to him. He goes into his little bedroom, and he looks in the mirror, and like, ah, oh, <laughs> surprise! In the mirror is the serial killer again. Like, of course. I knew that. I've known that for an hour and 25 minutes. Yeah, they keep minutes. showing that guy, and I'm like, we get it. Yeah. Why did um, I ever need to see him? Why did I ever need to see him? If anything, it would have been more interesting to not show him because then like, you could have um, been like, oh, like, is he even actually possessed? You know? Um, have you seen Birth by Jonathan Glazer? I love that we just name better examples. <laughs> this is just a movie. This, is, this podcast is a recommendation. It's a list of recommendations. Um, Kitties and kittens, I hope you're listening to this. Yeah, take, please be taking up. notes. Um, yeah. yeah, so in Birth by Jonathan Glazer, Nicole Kidman plays a woman whose husband has died and she's grieving him. And this little boy comes and finds her and says like, hey, by the way, I'm your dead husband reincarnated. I want to be with you. And she's like, that's weird, and you're a boy, and I don't believe you. And the whole movie is like a, is he actually the husband? And it's still kind of ambiguous at the end. It, this movie would be way more effective if maybe there was an element of that. This is also the plot line. This I would not recommend this one. This is also the plot line of Wonder Woman 1984. Oh, God. <laughs> where Chris Pine's character comes back to life and embodies some poor man's body. And then... Mm. Gal Gadot, shout out to the IDF. Um, <laughs> Actually, no, no shout out to the no IDF. No shout out to the IDF. But uh, Just she, to make uh, that crystal clear. She, uh, she, uh, she has sex with that guy, which is weird. And then, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a whole thing. Yes, correct. So, uh, so, At least uh, it's not a little boy. At least she doesn't have sex with a. a no, a oh, it's girl. just a, it's just a stranger who has no. Um, <laughs> Who has no, you know, call whose, on whose life is just yeeted away, just from used. <laughs> yeah. Speak, you know, speaking of the whole situation, there's a scene in Wonder Woman 1984. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into that. Never mind. We're not going to go into that. We're situation. not going to get into Israeli-Palestinian politics. No. Okay. Free Palestine. I, you know. Yeah. I, I hope our stance is obvious from okay. just our general politics on the stream or on the podcast. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna leave this. You know. We're just going to leave that on. There you go. Yeah. Um, Prodigy, no good. I'm going to be honest. Like, just. <laughs> I mean, when, when, if you spend the whole chat naming other movies, it should yeah. tell you what the quality, like this movie. And it, I mean, it's just, again, like, like it's not a bad, it's not a dumb premise. I mean, you can make an evil kid movie again. Like, it's not yeah. like you're not making those. But again, like you said, like, it's just not. Right. And I, I don't want to, I, I worry that my student who probably recommended this movie is going to listen to this and think that we're bashing him and, no, and no, 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 he has no, no, no. bad taste. And that's not the thing. Like no. this, this is, you know, when I was the age of this student, I got really obsessed with the Jim Carrey movie, the number 23. <laughs> Do you remember this movie yeah. where Jim Carrey creates you know like it's this weird like phobia fixation on the number 23 he starts seeing it everywhere and it's like not a very good movie but it's like has just enough like psychological intrigue in it to make somebody who's not seen a whole lot of movies watch it and think like wow that's deep you know and and i would say that you know loving this movie is really just kind of an indication that you're probably ready for some of these be the better versions of this movie, right? Yeah. Like go watch, go watch The Omen, go watch The Exorcist, go watch When You Talk About Kevin, go watch Orphan, go watch Birth. Rosemary, Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary's Baby. You know, like um, I, I can imagine, the only way I can imagine watching this and really liking it is if I had not seen the other things that's doing this thing better. Um, uh, hold on, hold on, we got, here's, yes, Ron, I, I would agree with that. Isn't The Exorcist the mother of all mother of possessed child movies? Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything older. What is the mother of all mother? That's a little redundant. Yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe um, Village of the Damned is also a possessed child movie, but it's not just one possessed child. It's lots of possessed children. Um, yeah. Also really good. Um, but 
I mean, just yeah. watch The Exorcist. Like it's a it's that bad. one that one legitimately frightened me. Like that mm-hmm. one's a, that's a freaky ass movie. Mm-hmm. Um, Especially if you watch. I mean, this is I guess somewhat controversial, but if you watch the version that has the little like subliminal inserts, I love that stuff. I think that's great. Yeah. No. 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 Again, like Kitties the Kittens. Um, this isn't like an indictment on you. It's fine. You know, I mean, if you want to, if you, if you want to feel better, like go back, what, two episodes ago, to episode 350, where we were talking specifically about movies that we watched when we were younger, that we kind of like that were not good. Yeah. Um, that was so younger than this person, but yeah, similar. I mean, we all, all, all fall short of the glory of God. You know, um, <laughs> we, we have all been cringe. Yeah, no, it's not a big deal. But but take this and then go and watch The Exorcist and yeah. all these other movies that we've mentioned over the course of this entire 30 minutes because we've named so many movies. And I want to draw a very stark contrast between the student who recommended this movie and the students who made us watch Nomeo and Juliet. Yeah, I don't like this. Because those people were just... They were, you know, mean and dumb and had bad taste and refused to change. You know, yeah, like, they're, like they're they're just living a meme, and uh, and you know, <laughs> you know, art doesn't matter to those people. Um, you know, this if you like this movie, um, and and you think it is like really has something to say, um, art probably matters to you on some yeah. level. And so go check out some really good art because there's a lot of really good art out there that's along the same lines. Yeah, do that. Screw those Nomeo and Juliet kids. Yeah. I don't know. We can't really talk. We talked about October like two weeks ago. So, you know. Oh, that's still happening. We're living in a meme as well. <laughs> we're going to investigate the meme, interrogate the meme. Yeah, to the, uh, to the, to the, to the, to the chagrin of other cinematarians. So, I'm doing a little like um, midday school club next year called meme analysis where I'm going to have students bring in memes they saw this week and we're going to analyze them. There you go. That's a, yeah. So the movies we saw this week, we have memes. We saw memes. We saw this week where I get to find out how many of our students are secret Nazis. That's true. That's a good, that's a good gauge. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. You should. Yeah, that's true. Um, any other thoughts? On Prodigy, no, not really. Yeah, just, I, mean, I mean, I guess, my, I guess, my closing thought is like, there, there's like the bones here of an interesting movie, but it doesn't have, like I said, it doesn't have the filmmaking chops, and also doesn't have the ideas undergirding it to like make it interesting to think about on a deep level. Yeah, and so all, all it is is plot. Like it's just plot, plot, plot. And most of the plot is just explaining stuff we already know. Um, yeah, so. and it's it doesn't even have any fun. Like it's just it's it, it it's just very like like very like serious. It is. Yeah, and you're just like hey, like have some fun with it, Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which yeah. Orphan has a lot of fun with it. Orphan's That's having a lot of fun movie. It's having a good time. I heard that they were making a, a sequel or prequel or something to it. They're making is something. The, uh, is is Colisera attached? I, I would watch that. I'm not. To- I'm not totally sure. Oh, we didn't look at the box office mojo. The people actually see this. Oh yeah, let's see. Um, it it opened. It did not make its money back. The budget was six million dollars, and it uh, opened to five million eight hundred dollars. Though I guess eventually it got its money back. But- what? 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 What was the week that? Like, who was? What was the big movie that week it Ooh. came out? Good this came out February. Oh, that's in Poland. When did it come out in America? <laughs> oh, it was Orion Pictures put it out, which is like yeah. such a weird company now. They were like a really big deal in the 80s and 90s. And mm-hmm. they just disappeared for a long time. And now they weirdly exist again, but they're only like halfway distributing their movies like they put out anna and the apocalypse but they didn't put it out in like any theaters even though they're like a big deal um Mm. so that that kind of answers my question this movie was probably barely released um and and was probably 
found by this uh, this person on a streaming service somewhere because this is this is the kind of movie that just kind of like fills up the the streaming service bargain bin you know yeah this is this is this felt like i mean i watched it on on amazon but it's also on hulu and it feels mm-hmm. like a netflix movie so right take that with what a you bad know. netflix movie there's some good ones yeah but, but man the most are bad most are bad most are bad <laughs> um all right. Well, that'll wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary on Twitter and Instagram at handle at cinematary and on Letterboxd at letterboxd.com slash cinematary. We post all the movies. Well, not all of them in this episode because we named a bunch of them, but we named a lot. The, the prime movies that we talked about in this episode. Um, and as we mentioned, patreon.com slash cemetery. We do these Patreon picks occasionally when we need to kind of fill in some, some gaps. And so uh, if you have signed up for Cemetery's Patreon and you have not sent me a movie that you want us to talk about, we'll talk about whatever. So, I mean, we just talked about this one. So, I mean, come on. No, no guarantees. We'll say nice things about it, but we will watch no. it. And we'll talk about it. That's true. That's yeah. true. Next yeah. week, we got a great one. I'm so excited. Yeah, guys. shout out to Candace on that one. Um, yeah. Cam, Chad Newsom, Christina Daughtry, Corey Willingham, Harry Eskin, Candace Sisson, Maggie, Ron Hayes, Titus Arthur, Tyler Chandler, and Whitney Rhea Ross. Thank you so much for your patronage. Yeah, well, next week we got Candace sent me that she would like us to talk. And we, we really can't shit talk this one because it's her favorite movie of all time. So it would be well, bad. There's no reason to shit talk it. No, I might shit talk Reese Witherspoon, I'll be honest. <sighs> um, but we're going to talk about Legally Blonde. Legally Blonde. Hey, can I give, you know, intrepid viewers slash listeners a homework assignment? Um, If you want to get more out of Legally Blonde, you should go read the the short story, um, uh, A Jury of Her Peers by uh, what Susan Glassbell. Susan Glassbell is the author. Uh, Commonly taught in high school and college, so maybe you've already read it. Um, I assigned it to my my students this past semester, and my honor students had the option to watch several movies, but one of them was Legally Blonde. And I got some really good essays comparing a jury of her peers to Legally Blonde. There, there. I feel like Legally Blonde. Like I'm not going to be on that episode, but I'll go ahead and give my like my quick take on it here. here it presents itself as like a very like silly movie. But it is actually very, very smart, and that—that's kind of um, that goes along with the, you know, the arc of the main character, I guess. Um, it, it is, it is a very uh, sharp and quick-witted movie. Also, the writer, one of the writers of this movie, has made several like chick, like really intelligent, like chick flicky movies along those lines, and I'm kind of like an art a tourist stand for them, though I can't remember their name at this moment. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, my my thing on Reese Witherspoon, Reese Witherspoon is like the Tom Cruise, but like the female version of Tom Cruise, where I just feel like she's not a real person. Yeah, she's um, she's cultivated a uh, an image for yeah. sure. We can we can address that. In the, I she's great in that movie. I'm not that has nothing to do with it. Just I'll probably address that in the mm-hmm. next episode. Anyway, thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye.